We didn't have much time discussing acute promyelocytic leukaemia, Richard, but what do you feel, where do you feel we're at? Are the questions all the done deal now with arsenic and atra or what? I do don't think, think they're all done. I don't think the unmet need is thankfully rapidly diminishing. Uh, Dr. Ciccone from Italy did go over some of the important unanswered questions. For example, the optimal way to treat uh, high-risk disease is still a bit of a question mark in some people's uh, minds. The uh, toxicity of the treatment, particularly arsenic-induced neuropathy, and how long you need to give the arsenic. Are we giving too much? And of course, can you give oral arsenic like our, some of our colleagues from the People's Republic of China have been doing? And of course, the problem of early death uh, in uh, outside the context of cooperative group trials, where you actually look at real patient data, you see the early death rate is 25% in some, some patients. That's a matter of, uh, in some settings, that's a matter of education and availability of, uh, of ATRA. So we're, we've made great strides for sure in that disease, but we still have uh, unanswered questions and things to do. Where do you see the immunological picture emerging in AML in terms of bites or CAR T's or even other straightforward antibodies or immunoconjugates, where do you feel that's going to move? Well, I mean, when, when we look into a success story in AML, it's, it's allogeneic transplantation, and that's immunotherapy in its widest sense. So I think there are probably immunologic strategies in AML which we can develop in the future, and I think there is a, a lot of things are actually going on. I mean, there are trials with uh, dendritic cell vaccination or other cell therapies. There is a development of uh, different antibody, antibody constructs, bites, or whatever. And I think th th there is a field which is really rapidly developing in AML. And in my view, this is probably the most promising perspectives that we have in this disease at this time. Maintenance, Mark? Maintenance has been uh, unfashionable, a big waste but of it's time for it, uh, uh, most of our history in AML, alas. Uh, but in fact, uh, um, we perhaps have not chosen the correct patients or the correct agents, uh, and whether or not it still works, um, uh, we are going to know at least something with the FLT3 inhibitors, because most of them are building in a maintenance component. Uh, and I assume that's going to apply to virtually all of our targeted agents that are relatively non-toxic. Again, we could be wrong about that whole concept of maintenance still. Uh, what has gone before may well happen again. Well, I think it uh, depends how you use the word. If you're talking about prolonged hypomethylene agent therapy for an older adult who's not going to get transplant, that uh, a low, slow prolonged course might be something that would be helpful for them. We've Show noticed an MDS. In a randomized trial. <laughs> I don't know of any randomized trials that have done that yet, but I know an MDS, if you stop the maintenance <laughs> therapy, if you stop the hypomethylene agent, they all relapse. So one wonders if it's going to be similar in AML. But I think, Mark, you mentioned that you had a preference for two years maintenance in one of your well, studies. And of course, the maintenance in the Midastorin study, uh, although they, not many of the patients got it. I mean, I, I never really understood the rationale for maintenance in the Midas Dorlin study. What's your rationale for, and, and should it be a Gleevec? Should you carry or that it, it was permanently? basically based on Gleevec in yeah. fairly positive ALL. Uh, when you stopped it, the people had this tendency to relapse. We saw that in our studies of serafinib. We took patients off at two years per protocol and got prompt relapses of the exact same monster that they had before they went for transplanted. So we said, well, that's a bad idea. Not randomized. So again, the, the current uh, trial we're doing post-transplant is set at two years. All of us are nervous what's going to happen when we stop the drug. But it is placebo-controlled, double-blinded. We have equipoise. We will find out. Mm -hmm. What was the rationale or the thoughts? Because that was when the protocol was designed, Richard. Because that wasn't what was happening in any of the, well, it was, you know, the phase it's, it's, two. As Mark said, one thought that with a targeted agent, you could suppress the clone, hopefully get the immune system to extinguish the last right. few cells. Okay. And that was clearly the reason. It was thought that a long exposure to that would be a good idea. In fact, that's still what's being done in the FLT3 field, as Mark, Mark suggested. The problem with the Ratify study uh, is that it was not a two-by-two two randomized design, 
as the FDA asked us to do originally, but we didn't feel that was going to be, it was unwieldy enough, as you know, with 714 patients uh, to do a two by two design. And so you had different views on whether maintenance should be allowed in the approval on both sides of the Atlantic with the EMA saying yes, we'll allow maintenance and the FDA saying no. We're also a little behind the clock in uh, um, PD-1, et cetera, blockade, uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, I'm not seeing much encouragement there. Are you seeing any encouragement in the early use of checkpoint inhibitors? In well, the single agent checkpoint inhibitors are not, uh, have not panned out very well, ex except in the post-transplant setting. Uh, the work done at uh, Dana Farber and elsewhere that show that ipilimumab has causes some responses in AML, especially extramedullary. But I think there was some exciting data, data showed by Dr. Daver about the use of Aza plus Nevo Lumab yeah. plus ipilimumab, uh, and so maybe you need a little bit more jazzing up of the uh, immune system than, than than maybe you do in cell tumors. I mean, but the that might work, be a maintenance. The, the agents work in the more muted mutated cancers, and AML is uh, you know we always show the right. slide of how many mutations are in AML way at the other end. So well, there are still a few around with a fair number of uh, mutations that could maybe be candidates for it sure. as a maintenance, maybe even as well or sure. a permanent. Uh, I don't know whether you feel we've made any progress in preclinical methodology to bring new agents of promise that reliably into the field. I mean, you've been involved in quite a lot of this sort of thing, Mark. I think the drugs that are coming out are better designed. Uh, they're much, they seem to work better pharmacokinetically. Um, the, 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 um, the chemists producing these agents know what's going to be a more stable compound, have a better pharmacokinetic profile, you know, just better properties. So my general sense is that it actually is seemingly getting easier to make drugs, at least at the very early uh, stretch. And I, I also think that the um, model systems are improving yeah. uh, compared to HL60, which right. you, <laughs> you, you, you coughed on there and the things died. So then, we, then we're going to uh, make coughing as a... They had therapy. P53 mutations. Here. They did. Yeah, we used to say they were APL. But I mean, I, seriously, the... <laughs> You've got the, uh, obviously the PDX models, the xenograft models of human leukemias and mice, which are more faithful. And you've got the elegant, uh, now, you know, uh, two mutation leukemias that work that uh, Levine and uh, mm -hmm. Melnick were talking about. So um, I, th I think the curriculum models, which hopefully will pr predict for more success when it finally hits the clinic. So I think we've had a good discussion and uh, I thank you all for participating in the, this discussion and uh, we'll start the tape for next year's meeting. Here, here. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good.